about an hour and a half, finishing in the center at about noon. And then you are going to have your free time for about two and a half hours for having lunch, a little bit of the sightseeing on your own, and uh, maybe a little bit of shopping. And then we are going to meet in the center of the town again, the same spot as we are going to finish the tour at 2.30, and we are going to drive uh, back to Linz. The walk from the main square to the bus, it's about 15 minutes flat walk, uh, nothing uh, difficult. Uh, and we should be back uh, in Linz approximately about 4, 4.15. And then there is going to be an opportunity for the ones that would like to go to Linz to get on one of the buses and uh, for some time you can also see the old town of Linz as well. So we'll arrange that uh, and uh, talk about it on the way back so you know how it's going to work. Uh, so you have an idea for the ones that will still have the energy maybe in the afternoon and you would like to see Linz. So that's the plan uh, for today. Please, if you could fasten your seatbelts, so we'll be pretty much driving on the highway. So for the safety purposes, at the bottom of your seats, you have the arms. If you would like to put them up uh, for some, it's maybe more comfortable. It's really at the bottom. You have to reach to the bottom of your seats, and then you can put it up. I'm also going to sit down uh, and put my seatbelt on, but I'll be talking to you along the way uh, about Linz, so Austria, of course, the Czech Republic. After the break for the bathroom, I'm going to hand out the maps of Český Kromlov, and then we are also going to talk about the town. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer your questions as well. leaving Linz actually pretty soon getting on the highway over here so just a couple words about this uh, large city uh, in Austria Linz is uh, the third largest city in 100,000 inhabitants so for some of you maybe not as big because really often you come from large cities with a few million people but uh, definitely it's much bigger than Chesky Kremlov where we are going because Chesky Kremlov has only about 13,000 inhabitants so it's just a little medieval town where we are going but don't worry we won't be definitely alone in the streets because Český Kromlov is the second most visited place after Prague in the Czech Republic. So we get something between one and a half million to two million visitors a year. So definitely quite a few people in the streets, but the population of the town is quite small uh, compared to Linz, definitely. And Linz is also a really important city uh, for Austria because of industry. Uh, so there are a lot of factories. For example, there is a big stainless steel factory uh, in Linz. So, and some of these factories, they were built around the That's Second World War uh, because some of them were built by Hitler, who considered Linz as his hometown. And he really had some big plans with Linz. And that's why he was building uh, the industry around here. So Hitler is definitely one of the important persons from the history of Linz. Another important person from the history of Linz is Johannes Kepler, who was a mathematician and astronomist. And uh, there is an interesting connection between Linz and Prague, because Johannes Kepler lived in Prague uh, in the 1500s, working for Rudolf II over there. And then he decided to move to Linz, and he was working over here uh, in Linz. And that's the reason why they have Johannes Kepler University over here in Linz. And Linz is also important because of a uh, big intersection. A lot of the roads are meeting here in Linz. So there is a highway coming from Passau, Salzburg, Vienna, and then the highway we are using now to get to the border of the Czech Republic, even though this border, uh, this uh, highway doesn't go all the way to the border, we'll be getting off uh, to smaller road, uh, but quite far we'll be driving uh, on the highway. Plus what is really important for Linz is Danube, which you are experiencing because they have the biggest port uh, on Danube uh, in Linz, uh, and it's mainly because of uh, the industry. Then the railway is also quite large there, so a lot of the trains are meeting uh, in Linz, uh, so an important city, which is not even very far from the border of the Czech Republic, so quite a lot of people from the Czech Republic come over here to work. And then also from the surroundings of Linz, so about 30,000 people come to Linz for work. So usually in the morning the traffic is quite heavy uh, because of people coming to work and then in the afternoon gets heavy again when people are leaving. But today we noticed that the traffic wasn't nearly as heavy as it is normally. And the reason is that they have the last day of school in uh, Austria, uh, so the kids are 
finishing school uh, today, and so probably many people are starting their vacation already. So I would like to also introduce myself a little more, now when I told you about Linz a little. So I'm really local from Chesky Krumlov, that's my hometown, that's where I was born and that's where I live. Uh, and uh, I live uh, in the new part of the town, about 15 minutes walk from the center in a family house uh, with my family, two kids, one husband, it's plenty. And I think he's a good one though. Uh, and then I also live with my grandparents, we have two apartments uh, in my house and I'm going to mention my grandfather during the walking tour because he was born in Chesky Krumlov before the Second World War. So when I talk about the Second World War history, I include my grandfather as well and I have been working as a tour guide over 10 years I really love it I enjoy it and I have learned my English while living with an American family I was a nanny for them for four years but living in Germany in a beautiful place called Berchtesgaden, where the Eagles Nest is, the Hitler's Tea House that's where the Son of Music was uh, filmed so uh, that's where I actually uh, learned my English and I visited the US with them uh, nearly 20 years ago. I went to Montana to start with. Anybody from Montana, by the way? Hardly ever, but there are people there, I know it. <laughs> I have friends there. But uh, I traveled in an RV uh, around uh, the west coast of the US. So we went to Seattle and then down the west coast all the way to LA and then Las Vegas, Salt Lake City and back to Montana. So that was my round trip nearly 20 years ago. But now I can say I have a family uh, and uh, we visited the East Coast for a change. So we went to New York, Orlando, and Washington, D.C. So it was a beautiful experience. We really loved it. And uh, my family is talking about the next trip already. So I have to save money because they want to go again. So we all enjoy that. So that was about me. Now we can compare uh, Austria and the Czech Republic because there are some similarities between these two countries. So first of all, the size of uh, Austria and the Czech Republic is really close, so 32,000 square miles, so that's the size of Austria as well as uh, the Czech Republic. And uh, the number of inhabitants is also really close because Austria has 9 million people and the Czech Republic has about 10 million people, so really close number uh, in the number of inhabitants. And uh, then both of these countries are the landlocked countries. When uh, the Czech Republic is neighboring with uh, four different countries, so it's with Austria, Germany, Poland, and Slovakia. And Austria is neighboring with more than that, so Austria has really a lot of different neighbors. So Austria is neighboring with the Czech Republic, Germany, Hungary, Slovakia, Italy, Slovenia, and Switzerland. So many different neighbors uh, for Austria. What is an interesting fact about Austria is that only 32% of the country uh, is below 500 meters, below 1,600 feet. The elevation of the country is quite high. And it's not only because of the hills we'll be crossing now between the borders, because the border between Austria and the Czech Republic are mountains or hills but it's mainly because of the Austrian Alps. And the Austrian Alps is a big business for the whole of Austria, mainly in the winter because of skiing. And I would say that nearly everybody from Austria can ski from quite early age. Uh, so they really learn when they go to kindergarten, it's part of the education over here. So everybody from Austria pretty much can ski. Uh, plus uh, a lot of the surrounding countries, I have mentioned that they have a lot of neighbors around here. So a lot of people come over here for skiing to the Alps as well. So for example, from Chesky Krumlov, it's only about two hours to get uh, to the closest Alps. So many people from the Czech Republic take advantage of the Alps in the winter as well. And then uh, the Alps, it's also beautiful for uh, hiking in the summer. So the summer vacations are beautiful there. And nowadays what is getting really popular, it's also bicycling. So many people go mountain biking uh, in the Alps also. And uh, both of these countries were part of the Holy Roman Empire as well as uh, the Habsburg Monarchy. And the first Austrian Republic was established in 1919 as the first Czechoslovakia, it was called back then, it was established in 1918. So it was immediately after the First World War. And uh, Austria is one of the richest countries in the whole world and it's part of the European Union since 1995 as the Czech Republic is part of the European Union since 2004 and Austria has Euro since 1999 
as the Czech Republic doesn't have euro. So we can talk about it so you don't have to worry about the currency. Uh, we have our own Czech currency. It's called Corona Česka, the Czech crown. And uh, as I mentioned, we get a lot of visitors coming to Český Kremlov. Uh, so you don't need to worry about the currency in Český Kremlov at all because all of the places you'll go to, they'll accept euros. So if you don't want to bother with exchanging the money, then it's really easy to stick uh, to euro. Uh, since uh, when you return back to Austria, you can't use the Czech currency anywhere else except uh, in the Czech Republic. So it just may be easier for you to stay with uh, euro. And uh, everywhere you'll go to, so buying your snacks, souvenirs, uh, lunch, uh, and uh, even going to the public bathrooms where we have to pay, uh, then uh, you can use euros there as well, so it's quite easy. If you would like to exchange the money, then we'll be passing an exchange office, uh, which I'm going to point out during the walking tour. Plus, uh, there are two banks in the main square you can use to exchange your money as well. Uh, if you use the ATM machine in the Czech Republic, it's going to give you the Czech money, I have to warn you, so it's not going to uh, give you euro. The exchange rate at the moment is roughly 24 crowns to one US dollar and about 26 crowns to one euro. So it's something in between. So if you divide the prices by 25, then you are really close there with both of the currencies. So if something costs 100 Czech crowns, then it's about four US dollars or four euros. And if something costs 1,000 Czech crowns, then it's about 40 US dollars or 40 euros. So it's really easy really to figure out the prices. A lot of the places they have uh, the prices written in both in Czech and uh, in Euros. And of course, if you ask, then everybody is going to help you uh, to uh, figure out the exchange rate and to figure out the prices of the things in the restaurants and in the shops as well. So all the places you'll go to, they are going to speak at least a little bit of English, so, so you shouldn't have a problem. And then going to the restaurant, you don't need to worry about the language either. Even though we speak our beautiful Czech Slavic language, uh, it's nothing similar to German or English but the menus are always written at least in three different languages. So it's Czech, English, and German, but then you'll find menus written in others as well. So really often French, Russian, nowadays Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and others. So really uh, many different languages around Czeski Kermov. So you shouldn't have a problem to get around uh, the town. And I'll be talking a little about the restaurants later on as well. So you can learn about the cuisine uh, also. Now we got on the new stretch of the highway, which we don't have here very long. Uh, it's only for about three years uh, since we are using this uh, stretch of the highway. Uh, they were building it over here for about three years, and we are really impressed uh, by this highway, especially coming from the Czech Republic, because they are promising the highway on the Czech side as well for over 25 years, but they haven't started yet, uh, so we don't have it so far, unfortunately. Unfortunately, the Czech Republic is the slowest and most expensive in building roads uh, in the whole Europe, and we hope this is going to change. But. Uh, we are still a little behind probably since we were living under socialism with the Communist Party for 40 years and so we have to get there and hopefully we will one day but we are impressed really by the Austrians the way they build the roads and they maintain the roads it's just really impressive so we'll be even driving through several tunnels on our way and in no time we'll be entering the first one which is the longest one on our way it's four and a half kilometers about three miles so, and it's not even the longest one in Austria because uh, they have a lot of the long Long tunnels going through the Alps when going to Italy and Switzerland. Some of the tunnels are so long you even have to pay the fee to go through. So this is not the case of here, but we'll really go through a couple tunnels on our way. And uh, it must be a great release for all of the small towns and villages in this area because all of the heavy traffic going between the two countries, between the Czech Republic and Austria, uh, trucks, buses and cars don't go through these small towns and villages anymore, but they go on the highway and using the tunnels, so it must be a great release. And they also maintain the roads and the tunnels beautifully. Uh, so we come here quite often and we see all, all of the work they do, maintenance around, uh, and they even wash the walls of the tunnels. So it's just quite impressive for us coming from the Czech Republic especially.
we are out of the tunnel, the weather may be good better, right, when we drill through. So it was drizzling on the other side. Sometimes uh, the tunnel changes the weather for us. So I'm serious with that, really. <laughs> Especially when it's cold season, so uh, in the winter, then it can change quite a bit because the elevation changed when going through the tunnel, we went up the hill. So sometimes it can be a difference when coming out. So let's talk about the Czech Republic. Uh, about the history of our country. So first of all, I have to explain the different names of the country you are going to hear, because for a long time it was called the Bohemian Kingdom. Uh, then it became uh, Czechoslovakia after the First World War, and nowadays we call it the Czech Republic. And uh, you might have noticed in some of the media, uh, they were talking about changing the name again to Czechia, uh, which we don't agree with very much. And I think the main reason for changing the name to Czechia was that they were saying that the Czech Republic is too long for the jerseys of the sport people. Uh, what a good excuse, right? But I think they even registered the name Czechia. And that's what the sport people are going to use. Uh, but then we are still sticking to the name, the Czech Republic. And we don't like the name Czechia very much because we think it's too confusing with Chechnya, that it sounds just really similar. And also we have changed the names of our country so often that we would rather stick with the name, the Czech Republic. We kind of like it. And we really don't need to change our name uh, of the country that often. But really often, uh, our visitors on our tours, they talk about their relatives coming from this part of Europe, uh, late 1800s and early 1900s, and they would not talk about coming from Czechoslovakia or from the Czech Republic, but coming from Bohemia. And the reason is that at that time when uh, these immigrants were leaving uh, this part of Europe, they were leaving the Bohemian Kingdom and not uh, Czechoslovakia or the Czech Republic. And even today, the Czech Republic has three large districts or provinces, we could call it, and uh, the largest one is Bohemia. So the capital, Prague, even Český Krumlov, where we are going, it's in Bohemia. Uh, but then we have an area on the Slovak border, which is called Moravia, and on the Polish border, we have Silesia. So those are the three large parts of uh, the Czech Republic, and uh, that's the reason why uh, some of your relatives might have talked about coming from Bohemia and not really coming from the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia. And the history of the country is real long. It was already started by the Celts, and then uh, it became part of the Holy Roman Empire in the 11th century, with the first royal family called Przemyslovci, which is kind of a difficult name even for us to pronounce. And the first king, Przemysl Otakar I, uh, who was a really important king for the country because he was building a lot of uh, towns and the castles in the area. And the development of the country was really growing and it was quite uh, fast uh, for the country. Another important person from the history of uh, the Bohemian Kingdom was definitely Charles IV, who was living in the 1300s. And Charles IV, he was the emperor for the Holy Roman Empire, as well as the Bohemian King. And uh, last year we had a beautiful anniversary for Charles IV because we were celebrating 700 years since he was born. So a lot of the towns and places in the Czech Republic had all kinds of different events and uh, celebrations for this big anniversary of Charles IV. And if you have been to Prague, or maybe even from the TV, uh, you may know the Charles Bridge, uh, which is a beautiful stone bridge across the Vltava River uh, in Prague. And it's called the Charles Bridge because it was built by Charles IV. And then in uh, Prague, we have the Charles University. But touring the countries that are nearby, uh, so they take advantage of that. Really often we meet, especially the American students, coming uh, to Chesky Kronov for a day trip, and many of them come uh, from the Charles University. But then Charles IV was also building a lot of castles and towns in the area, and the life for people in the Bohemian Kingdom at the time of Charles IV was really good. Uh, because there were no wars going on, so it was really peaceful uh, and good life for the citizens of the Bohemian Kingdom. But then early 1400s, we went through the Hussite Wars, when John Huss, who was 100 years before Luther, he started these big wars, Protestants against the Catholics. And yesterday we had a public holiday in the Czech Republic, and it was the time when uh, jo uh, the John Huss uh, was burned. 
he was killed uh, for his opinion about uh, religion. Uh, so we had a public holiday, and those were quite serious uh, wars uh, that were going on in early 1400s. But then from the beginning of 1500s, we became part of the Habsburg monarchy. Uh, Habsburgs, they were ruling pretty much the whole Europe. And Rudolf II from the Habsburg family, he chose Prague as his main seat, and he was ruling uh, the Bohemian kingdom and the Habsburg monarchy. Uh, from Prague. I mentioned Rudolf about the same time uh, in the centuries. But then early 1600s, uh, we went through the 30 years war, uh, which were similar fights, also the fights between Protestants and Catholics, uh, which was kind of started over uh, in Bohemian uh, Kingdom, but then uh, it spread all around Europe and didn't affect uh, the Bohemian Kingdom that much. But uh, definitely the fights over religion of uh, the Thirty Years' War uh, was quite bad uh, all around Europe. And then from mid-1700s, Maria Theresa from the Habsburg family was ruling the Habsburg monarchy. And Maria Theresa started some of the reforms. And one of the reforms that was done by Maria Theresa in the 1700s was that school became compulsory for everybody. So even the girls had to start.